Welcome back to the Medical Board Exam Experience with Dr. Puffo. Today, our country of discussion is Canada. We have with us Dr. Kejini Logan, a Canadian who had her medical education in Russia. She has successfully passed the Canadian Medical Council Board exams and is currently preparing to begin her residency very soon. Today she has joined us to share with us her experience on how to study and prepare for these exams. Let us join Dr. Logan in our discussion. Who is qualified to write it? Okay, so um, who is qualified to take it is uh, you have to have finished your medical degree from a WHO accredited school. And um, once you have your medical degree, you have to go through a, a website called Physician Supply. That's the, the national uh, verification of your degree. So you'll apply to them and they will verify your degree, will make sure that you have the right credentials and you've graduated from said school and the school that you've graduated from is WHO recognized. Once you've done all of that, you apply for the exams. Uh, you apply through a portal. Uh, it's the, again, the same portal that you applied to get your degree uh, verified. It's through the physiciansupply.ca website. And you have to apply for three exams, uh, of which you can only, you, you need to take two of them before uh, you start residency. And the last one you can take once you're in residency or once you're about to finish residency. The first exam that you need to take is the Medical Council of Canada Qualifying Examination Part 1. Mm -hmm. short for MCCQE1. And the second exam is the National Assessment Collaboration. It's an OSCE format exam, mm -hmm. uh, both of which are required for you to apply to the residency before okay. you can uh, start working here. Okay. Everybody needs to go through residency in Canada before they can become a licensed physician. Okay. Um, the first part of the exam that I'll talk about is the MCCQE1 Part 1. Mm -hmm. um, it's a written exam and it can be written in other places as well, not just in Canada. Okay. Uh, you can write it in over 80 countries okay. and it's all done through the portal. You'll apply for the exam, you'll pay the fee and you'll set the date and you'll set the center that you're taking it in and you wait for that time period. Uh, the exam contains um, multiple choice questions and case-based scenarios. Okay. It is, uh, it's got 210 multiple choice questions and 38 case-based uh, scenario questions. How is the case scenario like? Okay, so you will be given a case, uh, a patient, you will have options, multiple choice options. It's based on what's the next best plan in terms of management. Think of it as similar to your step two, uh, sorry, step three. It's okay. very similar to your step three CCS exams. Okay. Uh, so you'll get a patient and you will have to choose the next best management or next best investigation or next best treatment. Okay. And then and it's either multiple choice or it'll be a written format. So you'll okay. have short answers or multiple choice. Okay. So, so let's focus on the part one now again. Are there specific resources or books that are recommended to use to, to prepare for this exams, the part one? Um, so we, when I prepared for it, I used uh, a book called Toronto Notes. It's written by uh, local medical students for themselves when they write this exam. Mm -hmm. I found it very resourceful, but it's also a very big, thick book. It takes a lot of time to sit and read. So I mixed it with uh, USMLE materials. So I used my step two CK and uh, step three CCS material to supplement my learning. Okay. Uh, although the questions are not as in-depth or as um, as long as the USMLE questions, mm -hmm. it helped me to um, uh, consolidate my knowledge from my Toronto notes. Okay. So, so during your preparation, are there some um, assessment questions that you use to assess yourself before the exams? I did. I used uh, two uh, sources. Again, back to UWorld. I did my UWorld questions from Step 2 CK. Okay. And I also used something called Canada Q Bank, which uh, tried to simulate these exams for us. Okay. Um, and you can also buy uh, sample questions from the MCC itself, the Medical Council of Canada. 
you pay for them and um, they'll give you sample questions and you'll be able to understand what kind of questions they make. Okay. So the best source is from them. Uh, they are quite expensive. And the second best source would be Canada Q Bank and your UWorld if you can get access to UWorld. Okay. So so the, the, the exams, can you take, do you have to take part one before the part two or you can take it in yeah. any way? Oh, you can take these in any way. You can take the QE1 first or the OSCE exam first. It doesn't matter. Okay. The last exam, which I mentioned that you will be taking during residency, the QE2, which is the Medical Council of Canada Qualifying Examination Part 2, mm -hmm. that you can only take in Canada and you can only take it uh, if you have completed one year of residency or if you have completed one year of internship okay. from whichever country you come from, okay. or you have been a practicing physician in another country. Okay. Otherwise, you can't take it. If you're a fresh out of medical school or you do not have internship, you cannot take that exam. So that is not counted towards your application to residency. Okay. But can you take any of the exams during your medical school time or you have to be a graduate before? No, you can take it before you finish school. Um, I believe it is 12 or 15 months before you graduate. You'll have to uh, get permission from your school as well. So if you study in the, uh, it's not the same um, understanding that the Caribbean medical schools have with uh, the U.S. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to get permission from your school. Unfortunately, my school did not allow me to take the exam. They didn't consider that I was, um, that I had gone through the entire medical curriculum and that I am uh, suitable and eligible to take the exam. So, so they denied me permission. Okay. Uh, so it depends on your medical school, but you do have the option of taking it uh, 12 to 15 months prior to your graduation. Okay. Uh, the key one that is, okay. because that's the only exam you can take outside of Canada. Mm -hmm. The second exam, uh, which is the NAC OSCE, the OSCE format exam can only be taken in Canada. You'll have to be in Canada to take it. Okay. So after your graduation, how long did it take you to prepare for the first part? It took me about three, maybe four months. Oh, okay. So during that four months, how was your study schedule? Were you studying every day oh. or how many hours per day? Yeah, I wasn't working. Um, I didn't have to worry about finances. So if these are two things that you don't have to worry about, you have the luxury of taking an exam in three to four months. Mm -hmm. I studied about eight to 10 hours a day. Okay. And it was seven days a week. Okay. I mixed my days with the morning readings of Toronto Notes, uh, then afternoon questions, and then going over the previous day's material at the end. Okay. And then the questions I got wrong from yesterday, I would add it on to today's pile, and then so on and so on. Okay. So um, until I felt I was about 70% ready when I took my first assessment. Okay. And then based on that score, I went back to studying again on my week areas. Okay. So, so during the exams day, on a typical exam day, how is the situation? First exam, the QE1 is um, about four hours in the morning where you will do your 210 MCQ questions. And then you take a break for lunch. Then you come back and then you do this uh, clinical decision-making portion, which is the case-based scenario in the afternoon. And that will last about three to four hours again. Okay. So it's about an eight hour exam with a break in between for lunch. Okay. And NAC OSCE, which is the OSCE exam, is a full day mm -hmm. um, exam where you will go through 12 stations. So the, the first parts, what are the subjects that are tested on? The first part, the subjects are medicine, surgery, obstetrics and gynecology, Psychiatry, pediatrics, preventive medicine, and public health. Okay, so there's nothing like biochemistry, anatomy, no, no basics? So oh. you are not looking at these exams as how you would look at the USMLE Step 1. Our okay. exams are more clinical-based. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't test about um, small details like gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria. Oh, okay. Uh, it's more clinical-based. It's more patient-oriented. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so, so the OSCE part, the second part, is there a special book you use to prepare for that? Unfortunately for the OSCE part, there is no special resource. Um, when I took the OSCE, they didn't have any resource. Uh, but currently, if you go to the MCC website, you can get 
um, case-based uh, examples of what kind of uh, stations you would see in the exam. Okay. Um, if you have, if your practice is very recent or very, um, very recent in less than a year, maybe two years, you should be okay with the OSCE part. It's all about communication and uh, how well you treat the patient. Not so much about how much you know medicine, as long as you're able to recognize uh, an emergency mm -hmm. and not kill the patient and are able to communicate with the patient and make the patient feel heard, mm -hmm. uh, the exam should go fine. It's more about your soft skills and less about your medical knowledge. Okay. So how long did it take you to prepare for the OSCE part? Uh, the OSCE part, I had to uh, find people to practice um, the scenarios with. Okay. So that took, because of that, it took me a lot longer than I anticipated. Um, it took me about uh, June, July, August, September. It took me about four months. Okay. Do you attend special classes for any of the exams? No, for the QE1, no, I did self-preparation on my own. Okay. Uh, for the NAC, I studied with uh, other people, uh, with uh, a group of people that had taken a few classes. I hadn't. So that sort of helped me in a way to see what they were learning and then apply it to myself. Okay. But other than that, I didn't. So I'm not sure. There are courses that you can take, okay. uh, but I don't know which ones are good and which ones aren't. Okay. Okay. So, so, so um, will you encourage a foreigner, like someone who is not a Canadian, to start the Canadian exam journey, looking at the person who have to get visa to come to Canada to take the second part? Will you en encourage someone to take this journey? Um, yeah, I would if they have a backup plan. So they really must have a backup plan. Here, the competition in Canada is quite, um, quite ferocious. But that doesn't mean you can't get in. I have a lot of friends who have um, who have come from other places. Uh, they had to go through the process of getting a visa, then uh, applying for the exams, uh, then applying for CARMS, and finally matching. You don't have to be a Canadian to do that. You do, however, need to have a PR status to apply for CARMS. You don't need a PR status to apply for the exams. But in order to apply for residency, you need to be a permanent resident in Canada. So if you can get all of that sorted out, I don't see why you shouldn't come here and apply and, uh, and try to get yourself into residency and work here. As long as you have a backup plan, as long as you can go back home and continue working in between, because you also don't want to lose your residency of practice. Mm -hmm. The residency program requires that you have been in practice within the last three years of applying for the programs. Oh, okay. So you, you said that the getting into residency is very competitive. So what do they look at? Is it the exam scores or what do they look at to choose? Like so the first cutoff, sorry, mm -hmm. the first cutoff is the score. They look at the score. Um, yeah. So you need to have, so for the QE1, for example, uh, they also have a limited number of attempts. You can only attempt it four times after which you cannot take the exam anymore. Um, and for the fifth and final time, you'll have to ask in ask and written permission to the, the board examiners to find out if they would allow you to write the fifth time due to um, undue circumstances. Um, and the NAC also is also a limit. You can only take the NAC exam three times. So the QE1 is four times and the NAC is three times, after which you are not you cannot take it again. Okay. It's a pass fail. It's a pass fail. So if you fail the exam, you can retake it. If you pass the exam and the score is not good, you mm -hmm. can't retake it. Okay. So and what is the passing score? So the QE one, it's a passing score is two hundred and twenty six, and it's reported on a scale of hundred to four hundred. Um, most people want you to do one standard deviation, and one standard deviation is thirty. So okay. You need to have one standard deviation at least to become a competitive applicant. The NAC exam, uh, which is the OSCE exam, has 12 stations. And of the 12 stations, you'll be marked. So you'll be evaluated on 10 of those. Two of those stations will be pilots. You won't know them uh, when you start the exam. Okay. And so do well. Do Try to do well in all of those stations. Okay. Um, the stations, uh, again, they test you on assessment and diagnosis. They test you on management and they test you on communication skills. Okay. Um, 
and you have to have a passing score of uh, what's the passing score again? You have to have a passing uh, score three hundred and ninety eight. Uh, Okay. and a standard deviation of 25 and a lot of programs prefer you having at least one standard deviation okay and to make yourself more competitive aim for two standard deviation okay uh, the exam can be taken only three times and okay. there's a catch for this exam the catch is if you take it once and you fail the exam you have to wait one full year before you can reapply oh wow so you can't take it. So the exam is given March and September of every okay. year. Okay. If you take it in March and you fail it in March, you can't take it in September. You have to wait for the following March or the following September to retake it. Wow. Okay. And you can only take it three times. Wow. Okay. So, so during and the wait period, are you supposed to do something? So in the wait period, you can try to uh, volunteer. If you're able to go back to your country, you can go back to your country and work. Okay. Because uh, like I mentioned, for residency, you don't want to lose your recency of practice either. Mm -hmm. And it'll help you with your NAC exam. So when you go back, if you can go back to work, uh, you can, based on the exam you've already given, you know what they're looking for. Maybe you can hone your skills, uh, become a better candidate for the next time around. Yeah. But you'll have to wait one full year and you'll have to pay the full amount again to retake it, which oh, is two thousand almost three thousand dollars. Wow. Um, do you do you think people feel their exams? A lot, uh, a lot people, of people feel people do people do fail the exam. Um uh, but more than fail, a lot of people are not exactly happy with the score they get. Hmm. So getting that two standard deviation to make yourself competitive, it's it's hard work. Oh, okay. Okay. So so the 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 the, the first part is taken in how many times a week? A, a year. Uh, the, first, the first part is given um quite a few times in the year. Okay. Uh the website will tell you how many times in a year you can take it and it's uh, given throughout the world. It's about 80 countries that you can take it in, not just in Canada. And it's okay. done through the Pometric Centres. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. If you have a two standard deviation, it's really good. Okay. So per your experience in Canada, do you think there are a lot of foreigners practicing or doing their residency in Canada? I do. I have seen quite a number of uh, foreigners practicing and everybody's journey is different. Uh, there are people who are fresh out of school. They apply, they get in right away. Uh, there are people who are fresh out of school, they apply, they don't get in right away, mm -hmm. and they end up having uh, years added on to their attempts. Mm -hmm. And there are people who have come in with 20 years practice and get in right away, 20 years practice and still not get in. There's a lot of people here you can get in. I only know of this route, um, the residency route, but there are other routes as well. Uh, there's something called PRA, which is the Practice Ready Assessment. Okay. It's good if you are a practicing physician in another country mm -hmm. and you can apply for those routes as well. Um, there is um, there's another way to get in as well. You can go back to medical school in Canada. There's a program in Quebec which allows you to redo your last two years in uh, of medical school and graduate with the Canadian medical degree and then enter the residency portal. There's different ways to get in. It, depends on your situation and which fits better for you. Okay, so if, if you graduated from a Canadian medical school, you don't have to take the, this board exams? So if you graduated from a Canadian medical school, you don't need to take the NAC exam, the OSCE exam, okay. but the QE1 and the QE2 are compulsory exams for everybody in Canada. The okay. only catch is if you're a Canadian graduate, nobody really cares about your score as long as you pass the exam. Okay. So if someone is, let's say, uh, a licensed doctor in USA is the, and the person wants to work in Canada, uh, will he have to go through the whole exams process or he can directly get into residency program? So if he's a graduate of an American medical school, he'll have and to go he's, through. He's done process. with all his uh, USMLE exams. He's, he's already, he's even into a residency program in USA. Okay, so then um, depending on the residency program he's in and depending on the need in Canada, he doesn't have to go through the licensing exams. Okay. Although he would, have to, he would have to write the QE1 and the QE2 just to pass, 
but not for residency purposes. But then he'll have to write the, uh, the board exams in Canada. So if he's a, a family physician, he'll have to write the Canadian family physician exam. So each province has its own um, exam. So he'll have to take that. Okay. But he, he doesn't have to do the licentiate exams just to get into residency because he's already completed it. Oh, okay. So do you have any idea about how much doctors in Canada have been paid? Yes, depends on the field. Depends on the field you're in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a hundred percent sure of that. I didn't look it up. If you are preparing for the exams again, what are the things that you would do different? Um, for the NAC exam, I would um, try to practice with not just uh, two or three people, but with a different, with a different set. So a variety of the people. The OSCE exams you're talking about, right? Yes, the OSCE exam okay. uh, with a variety of people because when you practice with the same set of people every day, mm -hmm. your mistakes are not uh, seen. So when you practice with different groups on different days, uh, you can learn off of each other and also realize the mistakes you're making. Mm -hmm. Some huge mistakes can hinder your pass fail and your score in the NAC. So I didn't talk about the NAC score. Should I talk about that right yes. now? So um, when you, uh, for the QE1, we talked about the scores. For the NAC exam as well, there is a score. It's also a score-based exam. It is a, it's a scale ranging from 300 to 500 with a pass score of 398. Mm -hmm. And again, with the standard deviation, they tell you that it needs to be, standard deviation is 25, and they prefer to have you have at least one standard deviation. And an excellent candidate would have two standard deviation. Uh, the scores are necessary because that's the first step in getting into residency. In order for your file to be reviewed, your file is reviewed based on the score. So if you pass the cutoff scores that the programs are asking, your file will get reviewed and then maybe you can get an interview and then maybe you get accepted into residency. If you don't meet the cutoff score, your file is never reviewed and therefore you will never get a chance to have an interview or get into residency. This is one of the reasons um, people retake the NAC. So you, when you take the QE1. Which one is the, which one are you supposed to take during residency? Is it the NAC? You say oh, you know the, the QE2, which is also an OSCE. Okay. Okay. So the QE2 is the one you can take during residency. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the so NAC. I the, mm -hmm. Okay. I get Sorry, it. Yeah, I get it now. Okay. So the QE2, a lot of uh, people have advised me not to take. Uh, it is much easier to take when you have gone through one year of residency in the Canadian system. Okay. Uh, there are resources and there are um, guides that the program itself gives you to help you pass the exam because it reflects badly on the program if you fail the exam. Okay, okay. So if you want to, if you don't want to go through the, pro and it's an expensive exam, so you don't want to go through that process by yourself, mm -hmm. you want to wait. If you can wait, wait, get into residency, finish one year mm -hmm. and take the exam at that time, okay. uh, you will have your preceptors mentoring you for the exam and it should go much more smoothly than it would if you had just written it by yourself. Okay. okay. So, so most people, um, after studying medicine outside their country, they want to practice in different country. Why did you decide to go back to your country and not consider other country like maybe Australia, USA, Germany? Oh, okay. Uh, well, I'm Canadian. I've lived here all my life. I just went overseas to finish uh, medical school. Okay. So naturally, I wanted to come back home. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. So do you have any specific advice you give to um, medical students, especially someone who is in first year medical student who has a dream of writing the Canadian board exams? What advice do you have for such a person? I would say start now, look at the requirements of the exam and study uh, as if you're preparing, not just for your local exams and your uh, tests, for biochemistry and microbiology and whatnot, but also preparing on the side for your board exams as well in whichever country you choose to uh, take it in. So if it's the US, then follow the USMLE plan. If it's Canada, follow the Canadian medical licensing plan. 
So if you start from day one, when you finish, it won't seem like an overwhelming task to have an entire five or six year program tested in one day with eight hours is extremely overwhelming if you're not prepared. Yeah. So start now and work your way towards it. And it can be done. It's not um, an undoable exam. Okay. So um, let's talk about the financial aspect. How much does it cost to take the first part and the second part? So the QE1 is uh, 1305 Canadian dollars. Okay. And the uh, Nakoski is $2,830. Okay. Okay. Wow. So and mm-hmm. they are quite expensive exams. And as I mentioned before, you have to go through the physician supply as well. And they also charge a fee. They charge a fee for processing your degree. They charge a fee if your degree is not in English and it needs to be translated. Mm-hmm. And they also charge a fee for contacting your university the second time. Okay. You finish the exams. How, how did you feel? Did you feel the exam was underestimated or overestimated? Did you feel you passed or how, how was the feeling? Okay, so when I did my QE1, I thought I had failed it because it, uh, it, it seemed so um, difficult. But in retrospect, when the exam score came through, I was actually very surprised. It felt, um, so as you're doing the exam, it feels like, oh my God, I don't know... Uh, the answers to this. I'm not sure if it's this or if it's that. Um, Don't let panic take hold of you. Um, So when the results came back, uh, I was pleasantly surprised. So I, when I finished the exam, I talked to a few people who had finished the exams before and were currently in residency. And they told me that they went through the same emotions. They left the exam thinking they had failed it for sure, that they were going to have to retake it. And when the scores came, they were like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Okay. So the same went for the NAC as well. Um, the NAC is a different sort of exam. It's um, a lot of people I've heard um, say this, and I didn't understand it until I actually went and took it myself. It's more, it's a, it's half acting and half medicine. Okay. Acting in a sense that uh, because you know this is what they are looking for, mm-hmm. and if it doesn't come to you naturally, you still have to do those things. Yeah. Um, So depending on uh, which country you're coming from and how you practice medicine in that country, Mm -hmm. the interaction that you would have with the simulated patient can become forced. And that's where the acting part comes in. If you're not used to um, talking to patients in the Canadian way, then it becomes forced and you'll have to act out all of those uh, scenarios and all of those motions. And that's what I found um, people from... People who are not exposed to Canadian healthcare, they found it hard because of this. Okay. So, so, it was that, so that means it's better for the student or the doctor to have experience before taking the OSCE exams? Uh, uh, well, not so much experience, but more along the lines of, I found that doctors who've had practice in their own countries uh, they're established doctors, they have a set way of doing it and they don't deviate from that. And that comes across in exams. And these exams are, they are they have to be treated like exams, not like an actual patient. Okay. You're being evaluated on your communication. You're being evaluated on patient safety. Um, you can't think of it as you're going in to see a patient, but you have to think of it as you, I'm going in to see a patient and somebody is marking me. Okay, okay. I found that doctors who had a lot of practice at back in their own uh, home countries mm-hmm. found it difficult here to switch into this. Whereas younger graduates and doctors with lesser practice, say one year or two years of practice, they found it very quick and very easy to um, switch their language and their body language to mm-hmm. fit what the exams required. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so the first part, you said after uh, writing the exam, you felt like you filled. Is it like the questions or the concept didn't come from the resources you used? You also did a lot of practice questions. So why was it so difficult? Um, so when I did it, like I said, uh, the USMLE, uh, UWorld and uh, UWorld QBanks, the questions were lengthy. They give you a lot of information and you're able to ascertain a diagnosis, a certain treatment. Mm-hmm. In the QE1, the questions are not as lengthy. They are very straightforward, very short questions, but the choices, they can very 
very easily be this or that. You would be able to take out three of the choices very easily, but you're, most times you would find that A or B, B or A could be mm. the answer, but one was the best. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I understand. That's difficult. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Logan. I think we will end here. Uh, unless you. you have something else to say. Do you have any? So, they, the current website for the exams, the mcc.ca, will give you all of this information along with sample questions, along with how your score reporting will come out. Okay. Um, we give you a timeline and it can help you prepare according to that timeline, depending on when you want to apply for residency. Okay. So depending on when you want to apply for residency, it'll tell you when you should take your QE1, mm -hmm. when you should take your NACOSKI, and when you would be eligible to apply for residency. Okay. Um, it also gives you a blueprint of all the topics that they would be tested on. Okay. Um, resources that you can use to, uh, to do your questions, assessments, and where to get... Um, which books to use to study for these exams. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us.